Well, it is good to be back. It's been a long two weeks. Let me caution you ahead of time that when the pastor is gone for a Sunday and he doesn't get to preach, you pay the price the next Sunday because he just can't stop. Let me say to you this morning that this message in itself is, is enough to get you excited. It got me excited. In fact, I did some things I'm kind of ashamed about. I'm ashamed to tell you that I was talking to myself out loud. I'm ashamed to tell you that I started talking to dead people. And we'll get to that in just a moment. You'll understand more about that in a second. I want you to know that as we've been going through this series together, this is the third in, the, in our part of the series about turning things around. We looked at Saul in his experience where God tried to work with, challenge him privately. God had to deal with him publicly for him to turn his life around. This today will be one of those stories similar to that, but with a different person. We're going to deal with an issue today of self-control, which I know that none of you have issues with. But I thought we'd still talk about it anyway, uh, because probably all of us deal with the issue of self-control in our lives. Um, it's the reason why we're human. It's the reason why that Jesus came, because he knew that without his sacrifice on the cross, we would always want to do it our way. And isn't that the truth? So let me give you some encouragement this morning as we get started today. Today we're going to look back at a lesson of wisdom, a lesson of wisdom from the past. And here's the thing that I want you to know. Uh, some warnings, if I could just say to you this morning, be careful what you hear. Listen all the way through. Uh, there's some warnings that I want to give to all of us, regardless of whether we live 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70, 80 years. It doesn't matter how long we live. You cannot gather enough information in one lifetime to be the best husband that you can be. That sounds very defeating. I I'm going to encourage you in that in just a moment. You can't be the best wife that you can be in, in, in lessons that only you experience in your life or the best, best grandparent, the best teacher, the best CEO, the best son, the best daughter. There's just not enough experiences in one lifetime for you to be the best that you can be. But God has given us other avenues for that to occur. Let me start by saying the second thing is not just your own personal experiences. And let me say to you this morning, yes, you will learn and grow wisdom from your experiences in life. No doubt about that. But see, God has also given us some other avenues to pursue wisdom. He has given us people around us, wisdom from those who have lived longer than us. Wisdom of seeing their suffering and their pain and their struggles that we get to learn from their lives to help us to become better in our lives. Funny how God allows us to have that kind of community together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We also have been given a third thing. Our experiences, the experiences of others. But ironically, we take uh, not enough advantage of this. But he has given us the very word of God to give us wisdom. Life experiences, raw, real life experiences of people who have lived a long time before us, who are gone. Who God says, I'm giving you my word, but in my word, you have this great hope. And that hope is that you get to watch what others have done and see how they coped or did not cope with it well. And how they trusted or they did not trust in God. And they paid the price or they came out victorious. God has given us all of those opportunities to grow so that we can have wisdom to be the best you, the best me that we can. And that's good news today, folks. And I pray that, that you encourage yourself in finding all three of those things helpful in your life. And if you're here today and you find yourself not opening the Word of God except on Sunday morning, then let me say to you, you're missing out on many, many opportunities for God to give you wisdom to be what you've always wanted to be. A better version of you. That's what we're going to talk about today. And in case you think, well, pastor, you can't tell me that the Old Testament and the New Testament have validity for my life. I just want to say to you this morning, it does. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 tells us this. Now, these things occurred, he's talking about all the experiences of the Scripture, occurred as examples to keep who? Us. Can we just say that together? One, two, three. Us. To keep us, he says. To keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Talking about the people that we read about in God's word. Examples for you and for me. Today's examples are that you and I are going to look at is going to come from the past. From people who have done what you have done or you've thought about doing. 
we're going to be looking back at a man who had an infatuation with what I like to call the babes. Can we just say that together this morning? The babes. One, two, three. The babes. Now, in case this week you got really excited and you saw the sign maybe Thursday or Friday, you might have thought that we were talking about somebody else. We're talking about a guy by the name of Samson. I don't know how many of you remember Ralph Samson. Anybody remember that guy? Some of you have lived a little bit longer and played for the Houston Rockets. Tremendous center. We, in your bulletin today, you might think that that's who we're talking about today. I'm sorry, but we're going to choose to talk about Samson instead. Both good guys, both good lessons to learn by, but Samson gives us just a little bit more in this area today. So don't get excited if you came here today thinking we're going to talk about Ralph. We'll talk about Ralph another day privately when it's just you and me talking together. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like for you to point out something. I want to get you started this morning. We're going to look at this guy, Samson. We can call him Sammy if you want for short. It's, he allows you to call him that. He was confused. He was confused by his definition of love. And I think that we live in a world today that's much like that, don't you think? And it wasn't until the end of his life, minus two eyeballs, that he learned this lesson that he had an issue with understanding what love really was. He had found out that it was an issue not of just love and a, and a misunderstanding of the word love and, and what that, that, that meant, but he found that he had an issue of self-control. <laughs> And I've heard this said many times, and I'm going to just share that with you today, that love does some, tr some incredible things in our lives. Love brings our greatest happiness. And so when you think about what real love is, it can bring you the greatest joy you can ever experience in your life. But it can also, it can steal from you. Because we don't have a, a clear understanding about what love really is. And it's all because we don't understand it. In fact, the Bible gives us such clarity about love because he knew that we would misdefine this whole issue of love. If you and I look at music that is, that is, that is sung today, uh, it talks about love. And, 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 and I, I'm not going to go back too far, but I'm just going to say that there's some crazy songs about love and what they say love is, and it's just distorted. You turn TV on and, and you look at commercials and shows and they talk about this issue of love and it's so distorted. In fact, I was in Florida this last uh, couple of weeks, and at the place that we were staying, they had this magazine rack, huge magazine rack. Everything that you would want, it was there to read. And there was these magazines about, you know, uh, about love and about better relationships and about rekindling love, and, and you don't have to, you know, re look past the, the, the front of the cover to realize that that was so very distorted. But we all have found in time that this issue of love is so misdefined. Not just by Samson, but by us too. So this morning we're going to talk about this issue together and, and what does he have to say to you and to me? I think that you could describe Samson in this way. He was what I would call a modern day Rambo. For those of you who know who I'm talking about, he was that tough guy that no one could stand up against. He was known for his strength. And he will teach us about love, not because of his strength, but because of his weakness. This morning, we're going to talk about this issue, this problem that he had, this attraction to women. He was attracted to anything that wore a skirt. It was like a, a bird. It was like, I'm sorry, it was like a, a, a bug to a light. It was like a dog to a bone. That's the way that he looked at other women. He, he, he could not keep self-control when it came to that. And we're going to look at his life because his life is so different because the one thing that we forget about this guy is that during a time when the Philistines had taken over the Israelites, he was what we call a judge. He was a person that God had chose to use. In fact, let me just give you a couple of names that you might, it might sound familiar to you. People that were, were judges during this time. People like Gideon. People like Deborah. And of course, the person that we're going to talk about today, Samson. And in this story, what we're going to find out is that he took this Nazarite vow to show his commitment to God. And then later on, we're going to find that he loses sight of what that commitment was about. That there's a vow that he took that there was two things that he had to do. Two things that was required. First, he was not to take strong drink. That was the first thing. 
The second thing is that he would not cut his hair. Those were two things. So his hair would be super long. Now, now we don't know how he cared for it and took care of it. You can imagine that every time that he, he had to put it up, every time that he washed it, you can imagine just how much time was spent doing that. You can imagine that during that time, he thought about that commitment. He, taught, he thought about that, that, that commitment that he made to God as a vow to him for what he was going to do to fulfill this calling that God had had in his life. And what we're going to see is that Samson compromises what would cause his life to fall completely out of sorts like a house of cards. A person who was trusting in God so much but would find himself struggling. In fact, if you have your Bibles, what you're going to find, the story comes to us from the book of Judges chapter 13. And if you have your Bibles, I, unfortunately, this story is so long. I'm really going to challenge you just to, to go home after today and read it for yourself so you can get the whole story. But I'm going to skim through it in a few places because it's just too long for us to do today. But I hope that you'll find that it's interesting enough for you to read it on your own at, when you get back home today. Uh, he was born, this guy Samson, was born to some tremendous parents. Uh, we're going to see that come out later this morning. We're also going to learn that from the very early age, this young man Samson was a strong man. Strong boy. In fact, the scripture gives us a story that a lion attacked him. And when the lion attacked him as a small boy, by his own hands, he ripped that lion apart. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible to think that God would give to someone such tremendous strength. So what we find is that later on, he becomes attracted to this girl immediately. And he tells his parents, he says to his mom and dad, he says, Mom, Dad, I want her. I want you to, to go get her for me. I want her even against your own feelings. In fact, her parents say to him, isn't there someone? Isn't there somebody in your own clan, in your own group to, to, to love, to marry? Instead of going outside of those who are uncircumcised, he says, no, I want to marry her. So, of course, they give in, and he has this wedding, and there is this wedding banquet, and the most incredible thing comes from this banquet. Let me give you a couple things to remember. If you have your notes this morning, you might want to write some of these things down, just so when you go back to read it on your own, it brings more clarity to you. He gives this, uh, this, this, this riddle to his friends. He says, I'm going to share a riddle with you, and you're going to have a certain amount of days to figure it out. He says, I'll give you a whole new wardrobe if you're able to figure out what this riddle means. So, what do they do? They go to Samson's wife, and they ask her the answer to the riddle. So, they come to Samson at the end of the time, and he says, okay, what's your answer? And, and they retrieve the answer, they tell him the answer, and, and Samson is so mad because he knows that it had to come from his wife. There was no other way that they could have got the answer to the riddle except it coming from her. Now, I'm going to share some insight for some husbands this morning. There are some times when I have opportunities just to speak directly to you men, and this is one of those times. There are certain things that I would call politically correct. There are things that I would call common sense. And then there's these things that I call no-brainers. Today is a no-brainer to some of you husbands that need to hear this. This is Samson's response as he finds out that his wife has spoken and given the answer to the riddle to his friends. Look at this. Judges chapter 14, verse 18. Look at this. Before the sunset, on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer... And I want to say to you men this morning, if that sounds just a little strange, if that sounds a little inappropriate, it probably is. This is not love language to us husbands. This is not what you turn and look at your wives and say, I love you, heifer. You don't do that. Can I have an amen from the husbands? In case you missed it and you thought this would be good for later on, don't go that path, okay? He said, you would not have sawed my riddle if you had not been plowed with my heifer. So, Samson, in order to give them their clothes, this is how drastic things happen. In order to give them their wardrobe, he goes out and he kills 30 Philistines, takes their clothes off of them, and gives them to his friends. And those people that he took those clothes from that he killed are left in their pajamas, bottoms, their whitey tidies. That's all they were left with. 
And now he, these people, now he is, because of he's murdered these men, now there's worse trouble. Now matters get worse than they were before. He comes back from this murder spree and he finds that his wife, the one that he had just married, is now with his friend. So she's left Samson and she is now with one of his friends. His wife has fallen in love with him. And he finds out where these people live, these other people that were so close to him, and he goes out and he kills them because he thinks that they're responsible for what has happened to his wife. So now 30 men have been killed. He finds out where they live. He burns their farm. And now they're, I'm sorry, they, they don't get killed, but he burns their farms and their crops. And now they're so mad because of what he's done to their crops that they want to go after Samson. So, we're picking up on the story now. Here's where it goes. So they say, it's the wife's fault. It's her fault for him coming and burning our fields. And so what do they do? These 30 men, his friends, they go and find her. She happens to be with her father. They take her and, his, and, and her father and they kill both of them. Now, in your mind, as you're hearing this story unfold, you have to be saying to yourself, this isn't good. This doesn't fly. This is not good for anybody. Well, it only gets worse. You thought it was bad already. You thought it was tough already. Now Samson is really mad. And he turns from Rambo to Dirty Harry really quick. And look at what happens next. There's now, after all this, there's a bounty on Samson's head. These people who are after him now have this bounty. And if Samson could speak to us, if he could come and talk to you and to me now, right now, I wonder what would he say? Can I just give you just a few things this morning that I think that he would tell you and me today? And the first I think is this. He would say to you and to me, listen to godly counsel. Would you just write that down this morning? Listen to godly counsel. See, this whole thing, remember I told you that he had some tremendous parents? I want you to know that all the way back when he decided to get married, when he said, I have found this woman, she's the one that I want to be with, and they asked the question, but are you sure? Because isn't there somebody, even in your own clan, who's not, who's not uncircumcised that you, could, that you could be with instead of someone who's not part of our culture? It started with that. Let me go back to jo uh, Judges chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, and look at this. This is what happened with that situation with his parents. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and his mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. You see, he was blinded by his desire. There was wisdom that was being given to him and he chose not to accept it. He pushes until they cave in and they give him what he wants. Now I just want to say a quick word this morning. You want to be careful for what it is that you ask for. Because sometimes here's what you need to know. Be careful what you crave. There are some things that are important in your life that you ought to long after, but be very careful what you crave. And I think this is a good opportunity for me this morning to speak to some of you who are young. There are some of you who are here today who are still under your parents' authority. And there are some times that you ask them for things. There's some things that you ask to do. And in your mind, you don't see anything wrong in it. You don't see a problem with it. And maybe there is no right or wrong in it. But for some reason, your parents have this feeling, this sense that something about that is not good for you. But you say to yourself, you say to them, but you don't know. Everybody's doing it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not illegal. Other people are doing it too. Why not? I just don't think it's a good idea. And we push back and we push back and we push back. I want you to know that Scripture tells us it's not always about what is right or what is wrong. It is a lot to do with what is the wise thing to do. 
What's the wise thing to do? It's not always black and white. It's sometimes just about an understanding that your parents have because they have lived longer. They have experienced things that you just have not been able to experience. That you just sometimes need to say, I want to know it's a blessing from you, not just permission from you. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But I want you to know this morning there are two types of sorrows. Would you please just write these two things down this morning? It's not on Media Shout, but I want you to be careful about these two things. It's been said before that there are two sorrows in life. The first one is this, not getting what you crave for. That's the first, not getting what you crave for. Sometimes the greatest sorrow in your life is because you did not get what you were craving for. But the second seems so opposite to that, but is also very true as well. And the second is this, the second sorrow is getting what you crave for. Because sometimes, folks, the very thing that you think is so right, the thing that you want so desperately, is the very thing that will destroy your life. All because you crave it, just like everybody else is. See, there's a big difference between a blessing and permission from a parent. I don't mean just from an earthly parent, but I mean from a godly father, too. There's a difference between having a blessing and having a permission. How many of you are parents have been in those situations where your kids have come to you and they have been relentless and they want to go out, they want to do this, and you don't think it's a good idea and you say no and they keep coming and they keep coming and they keep coming and finally you just get so worn out from it all, you say, okay, fine, your permission granted, go do it. I mean, I know that we probably don't raise our hands up and say, yeah, that's me, I can't wait to tell you that that's me. But there's probably times in your life that you found yourself there. Folks, there's a difference between having permission from your father, your heavenly father or your earthly father, and having a blessing from your heavenly father or your earthly father. Let me give you an illustration of that. In Psalms 106, God has that same kind of situation with the Israelites, his children. And look at what he does to them. This is exactly what we're talking about. It is so much better to have a blessing from your father than it is to have permission from your father. Because even if you have permission, it doesn't mean that things are going to turn out right. But look at this with me. Verse 13 of Psalm 106, it says this, but they soon forgot what he had done. Talking about the father. And did not wait for his plan to unfold. In the desert, they gave in, uh, they gave in to their cravings. In the wilderness, they put God to the test. So you can imagine, he keeps, they keep pounding and keep pounding and keep complaining. So you know what he did? He didn't give him their blessing, but he gave him permission. So he gave them what they asked for, but sent a wasting disease among them. You see, they got what they wanted, but their souls were barren because of it. It, they got what they wanted, but they were also barren. You don't just want permission from God, folks. What you want from God is his blessing. I think about the prodigal son who came to his father and said, Father, give, my, give me my inheritance. I want my inheritance. You know the father did not think that that was a good idea, but he gave it to him. And it was in that moment that the prodigal son went out and he did and he squandered it all and he found himself laying with the pigs and he thought it would be better to me to be a servant in my father's house than to be here today. And in your mind, you understand that there is a blessing and there is permission. And you have the choice to do what you want at the end of the day. But folks, there's something about having his blessing that brings encouragement to your life. In fact, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22 tells us this. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. So back to our story. So here in the story, the story continues on. So Samson finds out, Samson finds out that his friends have, have taken his heifer. He's killed them. They burn, the fields are burned. Now they have a bounty on his head. And now one of his own, one of his own friends, turn him in. They tell where his whereabouts are. And there are 3,000 men. Imagine this. 3,000 men are now coming after Samson. They come to Samson and he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know that they're after him. And he is unarmed. He has nothing to protect himself except his own strength. You've heard this story before. He takes the jawbone of a donkey... And he kills a thousand of these 3,000 with the jawbone of a donkey. Now, I know that that sounds so strange to you and to me. But in that moment, imagine that the other 2,000 are now fleeing. They're running away. And you can almost think that Samson, as he's standing there and he's watching what has happened, he says, look at me. 
Look what I'm able to do. Look what I have done. And he forgot one very important thing. It was God's grace, not the jawbone that saved him, that allowed Samson to live. Samson started to take God's grace for granted. And I think that you and I do that often in our own lives too. Grace of God that was not looked at by Samson. Instead, he thought it was by his own strength. And you know, you can imagine, here this guy is, Samson. He thinks it's him. He thinks it's all about him. You see, he forgot it was God's grace and that sometimes it makes us feel like that we can continue on in our sin. We, Samson can continue doing what he's been doing because nothing's happened to him. But just like Saul, just like the prodigal son, God continues to work in our lives. He extends his grace to us each and every day, pulling us, drawing us back to him. But we always have a choice. We always have a choice to come back to him or to continue in the life that we're going. And you know what the misnomer is about this whole thing? Is that there are some of you who have probably been here too. You found yourself doing some things that you know, and, and I shouldn't do that. But you know what? There seems to be no consequence for it. So I just keep on doing it. For some of you, maybe it's the way you treat your wives, the way you talk to them, the way that you, the way you push them around. Maybe it's some of the things that you say. And you think, well, you know what? She's still with me, so I guess I can keep on doing what I'm doing. Or maybe there's a certain kind of way that you are at work, and it's not the way you are at home. It's not the way you are at church. But you think, you know what? I, I do it every day, and no one says anything. It's not got me in trouble. In fact, my life is pretty good. So I just keep on doing what I've always done. And I think, well, you know what? Apparently it's okay. And let me tell you, in those moments, remember this. It has always been God's grace, each and every step of the way, that has kept speaking into your heart about coming back and turning around and doing the thing that you ought to do. Even Saul, who stood over Stephen, and he watched Stephen being, being stoned to death, and then later on, Saul, who later on becomes Paul, it takes him getting knocked off of a horse and blinded publicly for Paul to understand what God was saying to him privately. All the way back when Stephen was being stoned. And here is Samson. And he's going through one situation after another situation. His parents have intervened. They've tried to speak to him, tried to put truth into his life. And each and every step of the way, Samson says, I've got this all under control. It's all about me. I'm good. And look, I've taken on 3,000 men. 1,000 of them here are laying dead right now. And 2,000 of them have fled. Look at me. Look what I've done. And all I've done all that with a jawbone. How ironic. Well, they're after Samson. And now there's, what, what do you do now? He's killed 1,000 plus 30 men. They burn fields, and these things go from even bad to worse to even worse again. Samson now has this appetite. Samson has this appetite for women. He has this appetite for prostitutes in private. And this is big because God has called him. Do you remember at the very beginning we talked about this? In the very beginning we said that this man Samson was a person that God proclaimed to be a judge. He took a Nerorite vow a vow that would remind him that he was being led by God and that he was there for a purpose. He had a reason. He had a, he had a voice that came from God to speak into the life of the Israelites to remind them that God was not going to forsake them. And now Samson has found himself in this place. And he thinks that this thing is all about him. And now they're coming after him. And now he's got himself into this, this prostitution he can't see his way because he's now spiritually blind. Folks, I know that this sounds like this is a story about a man by the name of Samson, but sometimes, folks, that's your story. And it's my story. So what, is, what happens next? It went from bad to worse to worse. He finds this woman. And her name is Delilah. <laughs> and she is beautiful. She is something to look at. And he melts every time that he's around her. And you can imagine a guy who's already so, so drawn to that kind of thing that now he sees this Delilah and there is just nothing that he won't do. He sleeps with her. He loses sight of his calling. And we, what we find out is that she is going to hand him over to be murdered. <laughs> This story, you can't make it up. And I think if Samson was here, I think this is the second thing that he would tell you and to me. Would you write this down? Small compromises bring major consequences. 
small compromises bring such major consequences. This is going to sound a little funny. I don't want to. I don't want to make it out to be something that's that's folly or or jokeable with you this morning. But I want you to get this picture. Now Delilah is with Samson, and she has a question for Sammy, and she says to Sammy, "Sammy, why are you so strong, baby?" And Samson says, "Wait, why, why, why am I so strong? What's your secret?" What makes you so strong? He says, well, uh, oh, here it is. Why don't you tie me up with some cords? You tie me up with some cords and, and, and I, I lose my strength. Not six, seven cords. Put seven cords, tie me up with it. I lose my strength. Sammy, lay on my lap. Let, let, let me just put my hand on you. Go to sleep, Sammy. So she calls the Philistines. The Philistines, come here, come here. Sammy, Sammy, the Philistines are here. The Philistines are here. And he wakes up, and he goes out, off comes the, off comes the cords, and he, and he takes care of business, and they run off, and he goes back. The next day, he's with her again. He's with Delilah the second day, and she says, Sammy, Sammy, why are you so strong? What makes you so strong? He says, well, here it is. If, if you braid my hair, I lose all my strength. Sammy, lay down. Let me take care of you. He falls asleep. She lets, the fair, she lets the Philistines know. They come. He wakes up. He goes out. Second, he does the same thing. And he takes care of business again. Now, in your mind, by day one, you should have figured this out. If you're Sammy, you're saying, this ain't good. Wake up, Sammy. She's not good for you. He doesn't get it. I'm reading my Bible, preparing for this sermon, and I'm saying, Sammy, you're so stupid. What were you thinking? Even after day one, what were you thinking? But then the second night too? And then the third night, listen, this is, this, you just can't make this stuff up. The Bible actually tells us that she said this. She says to them, how can you tell me that you love me? And yet, here it is, and yet lie to me. And all along the way, what is she doing? She's lying to him every step of the way. And she says, Sammy, Sammy, if you love me, you'd tell me your secret. It's like, Sammy, you're so dumb. What were you thinking? But see, that blinds us, doesn't it? When we have no self-control, when, when we just let our emotions just, just run with it, it doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter what's going on. All we see is what we want at the end of the day and whatever we have to do to get there, it's okay. And folks, Samson is not the only one who goes through that. I dare to say that in your mind right now, you can remember a situation where you were just like that. No self-control. You just knew what you wanted and you knew you had to have it. So what does he do? What do you do when someone says to you, if you really love me, you would fill in the blank. Do you remember that? You remember the time that that guy said to you, you know, if you really, really love me, you just move in with me, and it'll be okay. If you really, really love me, you would, you would do this. If you really love me, you would. And can I just tell you that, folks, that what seems so, so right, what feels so good, we forget that God has a promise and God has timing, and when those two things come together, it is perfect for his will for your life and for mine. But when we're outside of his promise, when we're outside of his timing, God doesn't bless it. So, here it is. It wasn't his hair that gave him his strength. It was what his hair represented. It wasn't his hair. So she says to him, Sammy, come on. If you really love me, you'll tell me what gives you that power. Well, if you shave my head, if you shave my head, I'd lose my strength. I don't have, um, I love visual illustrations of that, and I couldn't think of anything I had. Matt, would you just stand up for just a minute? <laughs> no, I just tease him. But that's what it would look like, just in case you're wondering. Some of you are close, right? But here's the deal. 
So he's asleep, and she says, see him, he goes sleep. And he thinks just like the other two times, he just do exactly what he's always done. And this time things change. And you and I read the story, see the movie, and we say, well, it's because his hair was cut. I say to you this morning, it is what his hair represented. And what it represented was a devotion to God. A devotion and obedience to God to stay true to his calling. That's what was compromised. So she cuts his hair, right? Then she calls and says, the Philistines are upon you. This is Judges chapter 16, verse 20. The Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord, here it is, folks, in case you're thinking I'm just making this up as I go. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. <laughs> it wasn't the hair. It was the fact that God had left him. And all the bricks of his house now have fallen in. So it's not just good wisdom. It's not just those, those compromises that give us big time problems. The third is this. Partnering with God's promises plus God's timing will equal God's blessings. Would you write that down this morning? That's the third thing. Partnering with God's promises plus God's timing will equal God's blessings for your life. And, and Samson missed it just like you and I missed it. <laughs> now Samson, who was spiritually blind, it manifested itself into a physical blindness because when they took him out, they took a rod that was hot and they took out his eyes. And so now what he was spiritually is now what he is physically. And let me just say to you this morning, remember this morning, what we are spiritually will eventually be what we are physically. When you are compromising in your spiritual journey, you will compromise in your physical journey as well. If you are barren in your spirit, you are barren in your life. And in this case, like Paul's case, what he was spiritually, he is now physically as well. And if you want God's blessing, it has to start with a private, in private, in our devotion to God each and every day. One of the passages that I love so much comes from 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, and it says this, Dear friends, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you. Can you, you hear that encouragement to you and to me? But here it is. Even as your soul is getting along well. See, it starts with you. And it starts with what is inside of you, not what is on the outside, not what is physically a part of you. It is what is on the inside. I want all of us to prosper. Can I just say that's my prayer for you and for me? I want us all to prosper. But it starts in your soul. It starts in that daily walk with him in the word of God to remember what his promises are. What it is that his will is for your life. See, Samson's eyes are gone. And he is blind. And I bet he would say to you, oh, how I wish that I would have changed. <coughs> but remember this, folks. And Peter gives us this advice from 2 Peter 3, 9. He says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. You think that what God wanted for Samson was for his life to be destroyed? Absolutely not. He was not slow. He was patient. And he wanted Samson to not perish. He wanted him to have what we just talked about. He wanted us to have, enjoy good health and a good life. But pastor, here's the problem. Everybody's doing it. Everybody does it. So what's wrong with that? People sleep with everybody that they want to. They, they don't get married anymore. It's not convenient anymore. Come to the present time, pastor. And I think that the, maybe the smartest man outside of Jesus Christ to ever walk this face of this earth, Solomon, would said it best to you and to me. And he says, can I talk about this? Can I stand before you, Solomon would say? Can I speak to you about this subject that you're asking about right now? Everybody's doing it. There's nothing wrong with it. Let me just share with you this morning what he would say. Although a wicked person who commits a hundred crimes may live a long time, I know that it will go better with those who fear God, 
who are reverent before him. That's what his promise is. Maybe everybody's doing it. Even though it continues and it's getting better for you. It's not getting worse. It's getting better for you. But it is better to fear God openly and trust him in his timing and in his promises that bring about the best life for you. I'm going to end with this story. I tried to get it so I could put it on Media Shout so you could read along with me and I couldn't find the version of it that I, that I like so much. It's called The Empty Pot. Maybe some of you have heard of it before. It's a story about a young boy. His name is Ping. And he loved flowers and he loved to grow flowers. In fact, not only him, but the people in his, in his community loved it. The emperor of the community loved it. He loved horses, he loved animals, but he loved flowers even more. In that community, the smell of the flowers just rose to the sky. And it was one of the most beautiful smells you could ever smell. The day came that the emperor decided that someone, there was going to come a time that someone else was going to have to become emperor because of his age. And he decided that that person would be somebody who was in the community. Somebody else would stand and become that person. So he came up with an idea. And his idea was this. Because we live in a community where we love flowers so very much, he decided that every child would come before him and he would give each of them a flower seed. And for one year, they would be responsible for that flower seed to grow, to allow it to bloom. And he said, the best flowers that bloom from these seeds will become the next emperor. And everybody came excited about the possibility that they could grow something so wonderful that they would one day become that emperor. And here is Ping, and he takes his one little seed, and he takes it home. And he takes a pot, and he gets good soil, and he plants that seed, and he waters it, and he cares for it. And weeks go by, and nothing happens. He decides to take that seed out and put it in a different pot and put even better soil in it. And he continued to work with it month after month. And all around him, these other kids are planting theirs and their flowers are growing and they're getting bigger and bigger every day. And by the time the 12th month came around and it was time to present the flowers to the emperor, here stands Ping with this pot and absolutely nothing that is coming out. And as his friends are walking by and they're looking at his pot, his empty pot, they look at him and say, Ping, certainly you would not take this empty pot to the emperor. Not like this, not like that. Take one of our little flowers that's over here. At least have something to show as they carry their beautiful flowers to the emperor. One by one, each child walked in front of the emperor, each one of them showing their beautiful flowers. And with the eyes of the emperor on each one of the children as they passed by, there was a look of astonishment and, and beauty of a flower. But something about the emperor wasn't right. And finally, Ping, this little boy, comes to the emperor with his pot, with his, with his soil, with absolutely nothing to show. And all of a sudden, the words that came from the emperor's mouth was something that could not be imagined. He says, all these people, all these children that have come one by one by one to show these flowers, I have been so disappointed until now we have found the next emperor. <laughs> and everybody is in amazement. And the emperor makes a comment that nobody knew about up to this point. You see, the year before when he gave each of the children a seed, before he gave them seeds, he cooked them. So there was no chance that the seed would ever grow. And all these children are now bringing these flowers, and they're not from the seed that the emperor gave them. And now here is Ping. And he stands before the emperor with nothing but the emperor looks at Ping and he says, I have found one who is true. One who is honest. One who trusts in what I give to you and you carry it with you even when there is nothing to show for it. You, Ping, will be my next emperor. Even if it has nothing to do with this story, what a, what a beautiful story. But let me tell you what it does have to do with this story. Because sometimes things don't seem right. 
And sometimes it feels like that everybody else is getting ahead and everybody has something better than you do and you don't know why your flower doesn't grow and you don't know why it's not blooming because you've been able to do such a good job. But it's, there's nothing to show for it. Here's the promise. One day you and I will stand before our God and we, we will be judged for what he has given to us. And when we have been true and obedient to him, regardless of what we think, he will look upon you and he'll look upon me and he will say, well done, my good and my faithful servant. Oh, how I think that Samson would say to you and to me today, oh, how I wish I could have gone back I wish I could have listened to that wise counsel from my parents. Oh, how I wish that, that I would not have compromised. I wish that I wouldn't have done those things. I wish that I would have had more self-control. I wish I would have trusted in God's grace and mercy for me rather than my own self because my own self only took me down a path that I should have never gone. Folks, there's a lot of people, I think, in this room who could talk about a path that you've already traveled. And you know what it's like to do it on your own. And let me just say to you this morning that there is something about following with his promises and his timing that makes everything, his blessings perfect in your life and in mine. Sometimes he speaks to us in those quiet moments and we don't listen. And sometimes he has to get to the point where he speaks to us publicly to get us to turn back. And folks, it is so much easier to listen to him in those quiet moments when his grace is still pouring out to us, when he's still opening the opportunity for you and I to turn to him and still waiting to that moment where we think that this is all about me, it's all about you. I will say this and then we're going to close. When I think about me and I think about what I do, I am reminded every single day that this is not about me. It's not about what I think I am or what I think I can do. But folks, it is always going to be about what God does in me and through me. And that same thing applies to you and to everyone else too. It will never be about how good you are, but it will always be about how great your God is. And when you trust him and you're obedient to him, not putting yourself ahead of him, God will do great and mighty things, but it is up to you. He doesn't force it. And he will give you over to whatever it is that you want eventually. Not because he hates you. Not because he wants to hurt you. But because he knows that whatever it takes to get you to turn, that's what he will do. The prodigal son would tell you that. Samson would tell you that. Paul would tell you that. And folks, you could say it too. So I'd like to ask that you stand this morning. And let's sing together this morning as a reminder that what you think you are is not much. And that's not, that's not trying to be critical. But the real question will always be, who is he? Who do you say that he is? Is he just a good friend that you depend upon when you need him? Or is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? And are you obedient to him? Or do you want him to be obedient to you? It is up to us. You get to choose. So this morning, if you want to pray, if you want to give him glory today for what he has done, the altars are open. If you're in that place in your life where you say, Pastor, I think that I am that person just like Samson who thinks that it's all about me. And I can tell you that in these moments of grace, he's opening that door for you to turn. And all you got to do is acknowledge it. So the altars are here for you too. It's not a place for you to come because of guilt. But it ought to be a place of conviction because you're trusting what the Holy Spirit is saying to you right now. It's up to you. You get to choose. So as we sing together, I want you to know the altars are open. And let the Holy Spirit lead you. Let's sing together. Father, this morning how we are reminded, reminded of how easy it is for us to get off track and to, to compromise, to become so committed to our self-indulgence, self-control that, that really has no control at all. And what consequences we pay for it in our lives. And Lord, this morning I'm reminded that there are so many of us who are here today who could probably tell their story, that could, could tell their story about how on their own 
the destructiveness that it came and what brought it brought to their lives. And Lord, for others who in those moments found hope through through the cross, through the grace of Jesus Christ, and to see the difference that both paths bring. It's not by accident, because of you. And apart from you, we can do nothing. So this morning, Lord, we come to you with humble hearts, not thinking highly of ourselves, but thinking very highly of the one who has the power over the grave the one who has the power to change our lives from the inside out, to change our souls, to also change how we live and how we walk, how we act, how we love. Father, this morning, I thank you for your spirit. I ask, Lord, that you go with us this morning, and Father, that you would teach us these lessons every day. We've heard your word. Father, we ask now that we apply it, not just on Sunday, but every day. That what we know today becomes part of our lives tomorrow and the next day and the next day because there will be opportunities before us. We know that. There will be opportunities for us to to respond just like Samson, just like Paul. Father, however we choose will determine our outcomes. And Lord, may it be with the experience and wisdom that comes from you and not by our own. We love you, Lord. We depend upon you for everything that we are. And we ask that you go with us and be with us and walk with us and show yourself in a dark, dark world. We ask it in the precious and the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord.